She had gambling debts to pay off, so she became the female Tinder swindler. Then there's the woman who scammed her own supposed best friend with an imaginary uncle. Let's get right into the worst of the romance scammers. Number four, off base. Florence Massau and Mark Arom Akuo from Canton, Massachusetts were caught defrauding people out of millions through elaborate romance scams. Four other people were involved in the scam, including four Nigerian nationals. Still, Musao and Okuo were the ringleaders and scammed their victims out of more than $1.3 million. Musao used fake identities to create profiles on dating apps and social media platforms. She used these aliases to find victims and lie to them about her romantic intentions. Then she swindled them out of thousands of dollars when they fell for it. She had fake passports made with the names Precious Adams and Catherine Mutoki to open bank accounts in the Boston area where her victims could deposit the funds. Musao's accomplices told their victims to deposit their money into her accounts. She would then withdraw the money in amounts less than $10,000 to avoid suspicion. In 2018, one of the six conspirators found a victim online and told her he was a member of the U.S. military deployed in the Middle East. He sweet-talked the woman into sending $20,000 into a Santander bank account so he could retire early and come live with her in the United States. Kuo took the same approach in his scamming. He often claimed to be a U.S. soldier in the Middle East or Africa. As the online romance with his victims developed, he claimed he was desperate to leave the military and come home, but he needed money first. In one case, a woman transferred $137,000 to an account controlled by Musao and Okuo so that Okuo could claim retirement benefits early and return to marry her. In another case, he told a woman from Georgia that he worked in the oil industry in Kuwait. However, he was in love with her and needed $4,700 to be with her in the U.S. The woman quickly wired the money to him. In 2020, Musao told a man that she was working at a United Nations refugee camp in the Middle East and wanted to come to the U.S. to start a new life with him. The victim sent her $7,800 to help her move out of the Middle East. But of course, these digital romances never materialized. Of the $1.3 million stolen, most came from romance scams, and another $20,000 came from pandemic unemployment claims. The scammers used the names of unsuspecting Massachusetts residents who were still employed and had never applied oh, for benefits. Man. Musao and Okuo were arrested on March 22, 2021. Musao pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit bank and wire fraud, carrying a maximum sentence of 30 years. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ian Stearns offered a plea deal that would put Musao behind bars for four to five years. Musao also forfeited $350,000 in stolen funds in addition to her 2013 Lexus sedan. Number three, words with scammers. When a widowed woman decided to pass some time on the Words with Friends mobile app, she had no idea she would be scammed out of nearly $34,000. Words with Friends is a mobile game similar to Scrabble, where you can play with your friends or random strangers as you put tiles down and play words that get you the most points. It seems relatively harmless until people with ulterior motives are matched with lonely, vulnerable players. The widowed woman from Tennessee, we'll call her Sarah, decided to download Words with Friends after her husband died earlier that year. She started playing against a man who said his name was Garth Davis, and they used the game's chat feature to get to know one another. Eventually, the friendly competition evolved into a romantic relationship. They moved the conversation to Google Hangouts where they confided in one another. Then, Garth told Sarah that he was having financial issues. He said he was a project manager on an oil rig off the coast of Ireland and couldn't access his bank account. He begged Sarah for help via cash and gift cards. She sent him thousands of dollars. A few months later, Sarah broke her foot, which made it difficult to go out and buy the gift cards for him. So he offered another option. She could send the money via wire transfers to his friend, Carla Whaley. Sarah sent him $20,000 in cash and another $3,000 through Cash App. But by July, Sarah grew suspicious and called the police. Fearing that Sarah was catfished, the cops went to Whaley's home to find this mysterious Garth Davis. 
but Whaley denied knowing anyone named Garth Davis. She admitted to the police that she was helping a friend move money, but wouldn't tell them who that friend was because she wasn't a rat. A few months later, police brought Whaley in for more questioning. She confessed to lying and said she received $20,000 from Sarah. Police looked at Whaley's Cash App transactions and saw that she received the money, exchanged it for cryptocurrency, and then sold it for cash. Between July and August, she transferred more than $10,000 to her personal bank account. There was no Garth Davis. It had been Carla Whaley the whole time. Not only was the widowed Sarah swindled out of thousands of dollars, but she was emotionally manipulated at one of the loneliest times in her life. Whaley was arrested in her home and brought to jail. She was charged with one count of fraudulent schemes and one count of financing a criminal syndicate. The lead detective on the case, Gary Kidder, said, This is a common scam, and they're not just limited to dating apps. There are a lot of warning signs to look for if you think you or someone you know may be on the verge of getting scammed. Scammers usually begin the chat by saying that they are out of the country for some reason, like work, the military, or family. This creates distance between them and the victim. Then they'll work on establishing trust before coming up with a medical problem or business emergency that leaves them desperate for money. Many victims feel a sense of loyalty and send the money, especially after chatting with the scammers for a while. But be warned, scammers are never finished asking for money. Once you send it, they'll ask again and again. If you see a loved one talking to someone online asking for money, ask how they met that person in the first place. In 2019, an estimated 25,000 people lost $201 million to romance scams. The average victim lost $2,600 each. Victims over the age of 70 lost an average of $10,000 or more. Number two, my best friend. Susan and Anna met while working at an assisted living facility. It started when Susan lent Anna a hair tie to keep her hair out of her client's food. They became fast friends and started going to nightclubs and on vacations together. But their friendship was built on lies. Anna said she was one of three triplets, two girls and a boy, but her brother died, so her biological parents put baby Anna and her sister in a plastic bag in the middle of Liverpool. Susan felt horrible for her sob story. The lies got worse when Susan said she had a crush on a nightclub bouncer named Stee. Anna quickly turned around and said that Stee was her uncle. Susan lost touch with Stee one day, eight years later, long after the club closed down. Stee called her to say he owned a business in Las Vegas and wanted a camcorder for Christmas, but his cousin Anna wouldn't get him one. He asked Susan to buy one for him. Susan didn't think this was strange because she had been getting updates from Anna about Stee over the years. Anna said Stee was recently married and divorced and had two children since he last saw Susan at the club. Things took an intense turn when Anna told Susan that Stee needed money for cancer treatment in the United States. Apparently, he was participating in experimental treatment in Maryland and Anna couldn't cover the cost herself. So, Susan agreed to cover half of it. It started at 1,000 pounds per month and started increasing over time. Two years into the cancer scheme, Steen needed money to buy an apartment attached to the hospital for 450 pounds per month. Susan found herself in a mounting debt she couldn't climb out of. She worked as many shifts as she could to cover Steve's treatment costs, especially since he promised a future with her once he recovered. Then, Anna's lies came crashing down. Susan realized Anna was lying when she saw her son's location wasn't in the United States where Anna said they were taking care of Steve. In December 2019, Susan had a breakdown. Her mental health was so poor that she had to move in with a friend. Susan started researching other things about Anna's life. When she called Anna's employer, a place she claimed to work for 10 years, they said they had no record of any employee named Anna. Susan researched Stee and saw no birth, death, or marriage records for anyone named Stee Lucas. Anna scammed Susan of 117,000 pounds. In Anna's house, police discovered all of the get well cards and gifts Susan sent to Stee. Anna pleaded guilty to fraud and was sentenced to 28 months in prison plus a 15 year restraining order. Even though justice might be served, Susan struggles to get over her best friend's betrayal. She has trust issues and is afraid to use public transportation. She's still so anxious that she can't work and hopes that her story will warn other potential victims of fraud. Number one, the female Tinder swindler. Jocelyn Zakur is an Australian woman who used Tinder to scam her matches out of money to pay back her gambling debts. Zakur was living the high life as a Crown Casino VIP member. 
But she needed more money to fuel her gambling addiction. Sakura took to Tinder to convince her matches to invest in blueberry and tobacco farms in New South Wales. One of the men was a chief executive with money to spare. He gave in to her requests as they built a romantic relationship online. He sent $730,000 in 17 installments over five months. He believed his money was going towards seeds, farm worker salaries, and harvests. Instead, it ended up in poker machines at Melbourne's Crown Casino. But he was hesitant when she ran out of that money and asked for more. So she sent him 240 emails in three weeks that threatened his wife, mother, and children. Around the same time, Zakur convinced another financial planner to transfer $61,000 for a fruit and vegetable farm. In June 2018, she persuaded one Tinder match to send her $110,000 and another to send $50,000 on the same day. One of the men contacted the police, discovering that Zakur didn't have a blueberry, tobacco, or fruit and vegetable farm, just a gambling addiction. Zakur pleaded guilty, and a judge sentenced her to four years and eight months behind bars. Zakur appealed to reduce her sentence, arguing that the men knew what they were getting into when they matched with her on Tinder. The judge didn't buy it. She was completely catfished, but somehow her scammer actually fell in love with her. And she was scammed into shaving her head. Let's find out what happens when scammers go after the most gullible people. Number 5. Catfished Christine Settingsgard was a successful business executive looking for love. As a single mother of three, Christine didn't have a lot of time to go out and meet people the traditional way. Tired of being alone and single, Christine decided to join the dating app Hinge in the hopes of finding a meaningful relationship. So when she matched with Mark Godfrey, Christine was quickly drawn in by his good looks and gentle manner. Mark claimed to be an architectural engineer from Greece who was working in the United States. He said he was was a widower with a five-year-old daughter named Haley who was living with his sister Kelsey in Utah. Mark was a candidate that checked all the boxes. He was kind, considerate, and also looking for love. As their relationship developed, their conversations moved off of Hinge. Mark would regularly text, call, and even wrote Christine a love poem. He seemed like the perfect match. Mark had an accent Christine thought was hard to place, but sounded European, and he strangely never video called her, but he was charming, cared about her interests, and even took an interest in the peonies in her garden. It's easy to overlook a bunch of red lights when you're so desperate for greens. After six weeks of talking, Mark asked Christine to help transferring some money to his sister sister and daughter who lived in Utah. Christine said she would, but before doing so, she asked Mark for some type of ID. She trusted him, but she wasn't stupid. Mark complied without issue, immediately sending over his California driver's license, so Christine transferred $500. Demonstrating that he's trustworthy, Mark quickly paid her back. Mark traveled a lot for work, so they couldn't meet yet, but Christine was patient. She knew eventually they would be together and everything would be perfect. Mark was even making plans to whisk her away on whirlwind vacations, and Christine was walking on air. But then, Mark asked Christine to do something bigger. Deposit an $85,000 check into her bank account and wire $82,000 to his sister in Utah. Mark said he couldn't access his bank account from where he was working, so he needed her help would allow Christine to keep $3,000 as a thank you. Christine agreed to transfer the $85,000, having no reason not to help. Mark's plan was to mail her a check for the amount, and all she had to do was deposit it into her bank account and then wire the funds to his sister. Christine followed Mark's instructions and deposited the check into an ATM. Due to a loophole with depositing checks in ATMs, the $85,000 was available in her account the next day without having to wait for the check to clear. So Christine sent the money to Mark's sister. Job done. A day later, Christine received a call from her bank telling her that the check had bounced and she now was responsible for the entire amount. In an instant panic, Christine contacted Mark, who claimed to have no clue what was going on or why the check would bounce. Not long after, Christine received a message from someone on Mark's account who claimed to be working with the FBI. They explained that Mark was part of a criminal network in Nigeria and that she had been scammed. Christine was devastated and furious when she realized she had been scammed out of $85,000. Worst of all, she found out that the poem he'd written her wasn't even his. This scammer was also a straight-up plagiarizer. The scammer contacted Christine again a few weeks later and claimed to have fallen completely in love with her for real. But Christine wasn't having it and demanded to know who Mark really was. She got her answer. His real name is William Ojo, and he sent her a picture of himself that looked vastly different from the man she thought she knew. Ojo said that he was part 
part of a criminal network in Nigeria and had been scamming her all along and begged for her forgiveness. Oh, and could she deposit another check for $30,000? Christine, of course, said no. Christine turned to friends, neighbors, and her parents for help. It wasn't until she went public with her story that her bank agreed to wipe her debt. Her bank would have happily left Christine almost $85,000 in the hole if it wasn't for all the potential bad press. Even then, she was still left with over $5,000 in phone bills from the scammer's expensive international calls, which her phone company refused to waive. This romance nearly left Christine broke in more ways than one. Number four, broke Bruno Mars? Bruno Mars is one of the most successful musicians today, with 11 Grammy Awards and countless hits under his belt. But it seems like even world-famous pop stars like Bruno Mars can fall on hard times financially. Despite his success, Mars is currently in the middle of a concert tour, and according to reports, he's struggling to cover the expenses. In an effort to raise the money he needs and make ends meet, Mars has turned to his new girlfriend, a Texan retiree, for help. Luckily for music fans everywhere, she has agreed to provide financial assistance. Wait, what? Lonely hearts beware. Even with Valentine's Day approaching, not all romances are as they seem. Just ask the anonymous 63-year-old Texas woman who was scammed out of $100,000 after falling in love with someone who claimed to be Bruno Mars. It was supposed to be a love story for the ages. An older woman finally finding companionship and happiness in her later years with none other than pop superstar Bruno Mars. But in a shocking revelation that surprised everyone, it was all a scam. The 63-year-old victim was conned by two Nigerian men who pretended to be Mars on social media. The men struck up a relationship with our victim and gained her trust over time. The men, Chinwendu Aswanwu, 39, and Basil Amadi, 29, reached out to the woman and convinced her that Mars was interested in pursuing a relationship. Bruno Mars is one of the world's most famous pop stars, so it's no surprise that someone might impersonate him online in order to take advantage of trusting individuals. And that's exactly what happened to this Texan woman. The woman was was communicating with the men through Instagram and Google Hangouts, believing she was talking to the singer himself. Apparently, Mars was interested in pursuing a relationship with her and that he was going to retire from his concert tour in order to be with her. The woman eventually agreed to help Mars cover his touring expenses by depositing $100,000 into bank accounts controlled by the scammers. The names on the accounts may have sounded strangely Nigerian, but true artists are eccentric, right? Chinwendu Aswanwu and Basil Amadi are now facing and charges of money laundering. If convicted, they could each spend up to 10 years in prison. This 24 karat tragic story is a reminder that not all relationships formed online are genuine and that it's important to be cautious when sharing personal information or financial resources with someone you've never met in person. Unfortunately, even the cautious get caught. Number three, worst best friend. Nikki Reynolds was excited to be maid of honor at her best friend Angela's second wedding. And Angela certainly looked beautiful as she walked down the aisle for the second time. As the two women embraced after the ceremony, Angela whispered in Nikki's ear that she needed to borrow some money. Nikki was taken aback. She knew that Angela was going through a divorce, but she had no idea that things were so dire. Nikki agreed to loan Angela whatever she needed and promised not to tell a soul. A few weeks later, Angela asked for another loan. She said that her ex-husband had died in a farming accident and that her share of the money from the the divorce settlement would be increasing dramatically from 5 million pounds to 77 million pounds. So she just needed to float a little. Angela promised Nikki that she would take care of her once the funds came through, promising the good life of houses and cars. Angela Kitchener was also secretly dying of cancer, but apparently didn't tell her new husband. Despite to help her friend, Nikki loaned her around 27,000 pounds, putting the needs of her dying friend before anything, because Nikki is awesome and we should all be so lucky to have a friend like that. But it quickly became clear that Angela had no intention of paying the money back. Apparently, Angela Kitchener had always been a bit of a con artist. Angela's deceit began to unravel when Nikki met another of Angela's friends. The friend confided that she had also lent Angela money. Both got talking about their experiences and realized something wasn't right. The woman decided to investigate further and soon discovered that Angela's claims about her ex-husband selling a business and dying in a farming accident were all lies. In fact, he was very much alive and well. Angela was arrested and eventually admitted to two counts of fraud and was jailed for three and a half years. When released from prison, it's unknown what will happen between her and her former friends who might still feel the pinch in their pocketbooks. Nobody has gotten their money back. Number two, rich company problems. 
Evaldus Remesauskas pulled off an incredible feat. He managed to get Google and Facebook to pay him over $122 million. And he did it by just asking them for money. Remesauskas was born in Lithuania and raised in a small town called Kaunas. He studied electrical engineering at the Kaunas University of Technology before eventually moving to Riga, Latvia, where he started his own business selling computer parts. It was here that he came up with a master plan to defraud Facebook and Google. Remesauskas set up a fake company called Quanta Computer Inc., which was the same name as a giant Taiwanese hardware manufacturer. He then registered this company in Latvia and began sending invoices to Google and Facebook for goods they hadn't ordered. Amazingly, both companies paid up without question. Rimasauskas's grift was pretty clever. He sent Google and Facebook invoices for items they hadn't purchased, which the companies then paid. Rimasauskas was extraordinarily brazen in his scam, going so far as to even register a fake company under the same name as a real Taiwanese hardware manufacturer, Quanta Computer Inc. Remesauskas also forged various documents purporting to be from executives at both Facebook and Google authorizing the payments. It wasn't until 2015 that the scam was finally uncovered. Over the course of two years, between 2013 and 2015, Remesauskas received $99 million from Facebook and $23 million from Google with his forged invoices. Remesauskas had also routed the money through various foreign accounts in Cyprus, Lithuania, Hungary, Slovakia and Latvia in an attempt to make it harder to trace. Luckily, authorities were able to catch him before he could disappear with the money for good, although they were only able to recover around half of what was stolen. When Lithuanian authorities caught wind of his scheme in 2017, Ivaldis was extradited to New York, where he pleaded guilty to one count of wire fraud. In 2019, he was sentenced to 60 months in prison in order to forfeit nearly $50 million, as well as pay back close to $26 million more. It's not clear what's happened to the other $46 million, but Rimasauskas was a prolific and and Baroque money launderer who squirreled away cash in Cyprus, Lithuania, Hungary, Slovakia, and Latvia. With $46 million stashed in bank accounts around the world, that five-year prison sentence will probably fly by pretty quickly. Number one, just a little off the tip. Megan Randolph was sitting at home, scrolling through her phone, when she got a text from a number she didn't recognize. The person on the other end, who identified herself as Ashley, said that she'd been referred to Megan, and that Red Ken Beauty Products was looking for someone to shave their head and eyebrows in a video tutorial. Ashley promised it would be quick and easy money with no risk involved. Just send a video of herself doing it, and she'd be paid handsomely for her trouble. Megan Randolph, a former model, was now out of work and struggling to pay the bills. So when she received a text from someone claiming they could help her make some quick cash, she was intrigued. Megan was reasonably skeptical, but the caller seemed legitimate. They knew who she was and had even checked out her work as a model beforehand. Red Ken does have a popular campaign offering tutorials on how to style and handle hair at home, so that only added to the offer's authenticity. Knowing this, shaving all your hair clean off is a big ask, so Megan decided to investigate the phone number to be sure. It appeared to be registered to Red Ken, so she called it and left a voicemail asking about the offer. After receiving a call back from what sounded like a legitimate business line, Megan decided to go ahead with the offer. After all, what did she have to lose? Besides, like all of her hair, her eyebrows. So on Friday, with her husband Jake filming, she shaved off all her hair and sent off the video as requested. As soon as the video was sent, Ashley pulled a Kaiser Sose from the usual suspects and vanished like a puff of smoke. Within minutes, the phone number was no longer in service, and Megan's new shiny white head turned red. The job offer had included a free wig and semi-permanent eyebrow makeup for Megan following the video submission process, but all she was left with was her bare skin and regrets. In the meantime, Jake had set up a GoFundMe page to help raise money for a wig and eyebrows for Megan. Fortunately, all Megan lost was her hair and some pride. Missy Brandt, a flight attendant from St. Paul, Minnesota, met Derek Aldred on Our Time, a dating site for people over 50. She'd been swiping for days, sifting through dozens of desperate, sad, and secretly married men in the St. Paul area before finding Aldred. However, he went by Richie Peterson at the time. Richie was a 45-year-old retired war veteran studying to be a political science professor. Like Missy, he had multiple kids. Missy liked his profile, hoping the only decent guy on this site would message back. A few minutes later, her wish came true. Richie sent her a message. They sent messages back and forth, exchanged phone numbers, and talked on the phone all afternoon. Missy wanted to meet him, but Richie was vacationing in Hawaii at the time, so the two planned a date when he came home from vacation. A couple weeks later, Missy met Richie for the first time. He was even more
more impressive in person. Richie spoke intelligently, listened, and seemed interested in a serious relationship. Eventually, Missy decided to introduce Richie to her three daughters. It was a big risk, but it paid off. Her girls ended up liking Richie. He took them on boat rides, they dined at nice restaurants, they even went on fun trips where Richie usually put them up in a four-star hotel. Missy thought she'd found the perfect man. He seemed to check off every box on her list. Though, there was one problem. Richie's life was a mess. He started canceling their date plans a few months into the relationship. He texted Missy saying he had to check his daughter into rehab, put down the family dog, and spend nights in the hospital. Richie told Missy that he suffered from chronic ailments sustained from military combat in Afghanistan. Missy picked Richie up from the hospital numerous times, despite her frustration with him. Every time something terrible happened to Richie, she was there for him. She stuck with Richie when his mom died and when he got into a motorcycle accident, among other tragedies. The more time Richie spent dealing with his bad luck, the less time he spent with Missy and her kids. And the bad luck was only getting worse. But Missy never questioned why Richie's life seemed cursed. Then, she looked in his wallet. One day, while they were spending time together at her house, Missy grabbed Richie's wallet and looked inside. Missy, when looking back, says she had a nagging feeling like an instinctual urge to look. There was something off about Richie. She opened the wallet and took out his ID. Missy was expecting to see the name Richie Peterson. Instead, she read the name Derek Mylan Aldred with a picture of Richie printed next to it. Missy dug deeper and found several credit cards belonging to someone named Linda Dias. Missy put everything back and closed the wallet. Her trust in Richie, or Derek, was now destroyed. Who was Linda, though? His wife? Ex-wife? Girlfriend? Missy didn't know. She did know that her relationship with Richie was over. Now, he was Derek. Once Missy was alone, she googled Aldred, half expecting nothing important to show up. Instead, mugshots bombarded the search results. Aldred's face was in every single one. Missy read the website titles and articles underneath the mugshots. They said things like career con man and master of deception. At first, Missy didn't know what to do with this information. Most people would call the cops. However, Missy didn't want Aldred getting away as he appears to have committed several times in the past. Missy found, in great detail, a laundry list of Aldred's crimes on the internet. Then, Missy says, she remembered the name of Aldred's credit cards, Linda. And after some more intense research, Missy found her. She sent Linda a Facebook message, hoping she'd respond. Missy waited until Linda finally messaged back, though it wasn't what she expected. Missy wasn't what Linda expected either. She initially thought Missy was a jealous ex-girlfriend trying to break her and Aldred up. Yes, Linda thought she was dating Aldred Aldred too, though she called him Rich. Linda, a retired military vet, met Aldred on our time as well. He manipulated her the same way as Missy. For example, Aldred knew Linda was a conservative Christian and made sure to say a prayer on their first date. Linda went on several more dates with Aldred, who claimed to have a purple heart. Eventually, she started inviting him over. But when she lost her job, Aldred invited Linda to move in with him, and she said yes. In fact, Linda was sitting in Aldred's house when she first read Missy's message. Linda answered cautiously, still assuming Missy was a jealous ex. Then she opened the links Missy sent. The links took Linda to Aldred's mugshots. Linda recalled reading the list of crimes and staring at the photos, thinking, how do I get him out of the house? The two women devised a plan to do just that. Get Aldred out of the house where the police could safely arrest him. Aldred put their plan in motion when he asked Linda to drive him to the hospital again. Something was bothering him. Linda eagerly drove him to the ER, dropped him off, then called the police on her way home. The authorities arrested Aldred and took him into custody. They called to let Linda know they had him. She relayed that information to Missy. Both women were relieved to have Aldred out of their lives, but now they had to deal with the repercussions of letting him in. Linda looked at her bank statements after Aldred's arrest and figured out how Rich made their time together worth his while. Aldred found Linda's emergency credit cards while snooping around in her jewelry box. He snatched the cards, called the companies, and ordered copies of each one. Then he used them to fund his successful looking lifestyle. The fancy boat, four-star hotels, expensive restaurants, and fun trips to Hawaii were all paid for with Linda's money. She also also discovered her shrunken retirement fund, realizing Aldred pilfered that too. Now Linda found herself unemployed, in six-figure debts, and hardly any savings to fall back on. She also had to pay Aldred's rent since the lease was in her name. Missy and Linda also figured out why Aldred needed to visit the hospital so often. It was his swapping place, where one of his girlfriends dropped him off and another picked him up. The question Linda and Missy had now was, how many other girlfriends did Aldred have? Linda, who was still living in Aldred's house, received a package address to the con man himself. 
The package contained a bottle of whiskey, chocolate, and a get well soon card by a woman named Joy. Linda read the sender's address and realized Joy only lived a few neighborhoods away from her. She contacted Missy and told her about the package. The two women decided to contact Joy and tell her the truth about Aldred. Instead of talking to Joy directly, Missy and Linda compiled a collection of articles on Derek Aldred. They left them on Joy's doorstep along with their contact info. Joy responded immediately. Linda invited Joy over to her house where the two swapped their oddly similar their stories. Joy, an IT professional, met Aldred, or Rich, on our time. Aldred told Joy he was a professor and volunteered at homeless shelters on the weekends. After dating the flaky professor, Joy broke up with him after a few months. She couldn't handle all the chaotic life tragedies. However, Joy had a change of heart after Aldred texted her a photo of him smiling on his boat with Missy that said, Life's going good. Just bought a boat. I've been taking my sister and her kids out for rides. My life has calmed down. Want to give us another shot? That's when Joy put together the package with the get well soon note not knowing she was inviting a con artist back into her life who'd stolen eight thousand dollars worth of jewelry her passport and her birth certificate joy didn't discover the items were missing until she read the articles about aldred's past crimes the saint paul duo quickly became a trio after joy bonded with linda over wine and a shared experience having your life ruined by aldred they of course knew they weren't the only victim while missy sifted through old criminal records she found a name most of aldred's victims chose to remain anonymous or only use their first names. However, one woman, Cindy Partini, provided her full name. Cindy is a Silicon Valley professional from San Francisco. Aldred stole her savings and destroyed her credit score. He gave Cindy a critical mission, fight for his other victims. Because Cindy's name was publicly available, many of Aldred's shyer victims contacted her for support. Cindy became the unofficial leader of the anti-Aldred club. When the St. Paul trio messaged Cindy, they had no idea what they were getting into. Cindy was obsessed with taking down Aldred. Missy and Linda started messaging Cindy more and more and put her in contact with other Aldred victims. The trio soon turned into a quartet and their quartet evolved into a network. Even though many of them lived in different parts of the country, the Aldred victims found community in each other's shared experiences. And they would need to stay together now more than ever. Aldred was on the loose once again. When Linda had Aldred arrested at the hospital, the cops only held the con man for 48 hours before releasing him with plans to find a more substantial charge to peg him with. But as expected, the police took several weeks to to find more charges. By that time, Aldred was out of Dodge and his whereabouts unknown. The Aldred victims were beyond frustrated. How could someone like Aldred get away again and again after committing so many crimes? Aldred primarily scammed his victims via credit card fraud and transferring money from savings accounts, which is difficult to prove if you're close to someone. Linda lived with Aldred. They, on paper at least, bought groceries together, paid the bills together, paid rent together. Since their finances were so intertwined, Aldred could make a reasonable he said, she said argument. She said, I stole her credit card information, but I say she gave it to me willingly. The Aldred victims needed to catch Aldred doing something bad. Bad enough to keep him in jail for more than 48 hours. With Aldred on the loose, Missy, Linda, Joy, and Cindy spent countless hours on the internet and social media looking for any new headlines and warning women that Aldred might be in their city or town. The Aldred victims had figured out the type of woman he liked to con. Professional career woman in their 40s and 50s, preferably divorced with children. To track Aldred, Missy messaged his cousin-in-law, Vicky, asking if she knew where he was. She told Missy that Aldred had fled Minnesota and stayed at his mother's house in Sedona, Arizona. After seeing the mugshots and listening to the victim's stories, Vicky decided to call the police on her cousin. Aldred had an outstanding warrant for DUI in Arizona. However, the Sedona police only kept Aldred in custody for four days. After Aldred fled Arizona, the network only found leads after they'd been victimized. They welcomed the new victims into the community while agonizing over how close they were to catching Aldred. The victims turned sleuths felt hopeless and isolated at times. Despite their efforts, Aldred was still ruining their lives, and they had to hear every new victim's story over and over again. However, the Aldred victims weren't the only ones looking for the con man. Aldred's most recent victim, Tracy Cunningham, received a call from NCIS asking if she could help them catch Aldred. Unbeknownst to the victim's network, NCIS had been investigating Aldred since his DUI arrest. He first caught their attention when he impersonated an ex-Navy SEAL. They quickly realized why Aldred was masquerading as a former SEAL and contacted Tracy. Fortunately, 
Tracy had broken up with Aldred before he could steal anything. But for NCIS to find him, they needed Tracy to take him back. So Tracy sent Aldred a message. She apologized for being, as she put it, hormonal and said she hoped they could start over. Aldred said yes and asked if she could pick him up from a doctor's appointment. Tracy agreed. When Aldred texted her that he was ready to be picked up, Tracy told NCIS, then drove to the medical clinic. The agents were already there when Tracy pulled up, but she still got there in time to see Aldred get carried away in cuffs. She snapped photos of Aldred as the agents dragged him along. Tracy remembers them telling her to put the camera down, but capturing this moment was more important than following the rules. Tracy knew some women who might be interested in seeing these photos. Tracy sent the picture to the Aldred victim she knew, and they sent it to victims and that they knew until the news was everywhere. Missy, Linda, Joy, and Cindy all message each other in victim group chats, fantasizing about Aldred's future in prison, which seemed inevitable. All of Aldred's victims gave their evidence to NCIS. With their help, NCIS NCIS built a very strong case against Aldred, ensuring he wouldn't get away this time. In late 2017, Aldred pleaded guilty to three counts of fraud, including two counts of identity theft. He was subsequently tried in a Texas court, even though Aldred committed his many crimes all across America. With the help of Missy, Cindy, Linda, and Joy, NCIS estimated there are 25 known victims. These victims lived in Minnesota, Texas, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. The courts ordered Aldred to pay each victim restitution, which added up to over 250 thousand dollars. They also slapped him with a 24-year prison sentence, ending in 2038 when Aldred is 77. In August 2020, a team of police officers filmed themselves tackling and arresting a man named Peter Foster on a beach in North Queensland, Australia. Many called the dramatic arrest overkill. Others felt that Foster deserved the public humiliation. Foster calls himself an international man of mischief. He was one of the most prolific con men in history. Western countries such as England are obsessed with weight loss, especially easy solutions that require no exercise or dieting. Enter Bay Lin Tea, a brew from China with alleged weight loss effects. Foster started marketing Bay Lin as an effective weight loss product in the 80s with surprisingly successful results given that it was just regular Chinese black tea. Veronica Ali, the third wife of Muhammad Ali, whom Foster was good friends with at the time, introduced Foster to the magic tea. Foster brought Bay Lin back to his home in Australia and created an unbelievable marketing strategy to sell the tea to people seeking easy weight loss solutions. He called Bay Lin as an ancient Chinese diet secret and a slimming tea. Foster says he put on extravagant exhibitions showing how well the product worked. The tactics fooled many people into giving Foster their money for a phony magical tea. Foster supposedly worked hard promoting Bay Lin tea, but he wasn't alone. He had a partner of sorts, 80s pinup girl Samantha Fox. The 80s were a wild time, and very few models embodied the decade quite like Samantha Fox. With some calling her the most photographed woman of the 80s, Fox was a prominent adult symbol in her heyday. She was also a pop star, releasing several international hits with titles like Touch Me, I Want Your Body. These days, she's most remembered by her generation as a Page 3 girl. Page 3 was basically the playboy of Britain, and you could find it in The Sun, a popular tabloid magazine. The Sun asked Fox to do a topless photo, and her stardom grew from there. According to the international man of mischief himself, Foster and Fox met at a party. Foster recognized her that evening and intentionally ignored Fox nearly the entire night. He says he talked to every woman in the place except for Fox until she finally approached him and asked him to dance. Foster says he read in that morning's newspaper that she could have any man in the world. To him, she could have every man except one, Foster. Foster is a self-proclaimed master of reverse sale, a marketing strategy that entices potential customers by either underplaying your cards or ignoring potential customers. The strategy, according to Foster, worked on both customers and women. And though his story might not be true, Foster did indeed date Samantha Fox. At the time, Fox was in her early 20s. She said in subsequent interviews that she never dated someone like Foster ever again and blamed the lousy relationship choice on her young age. Fox at the time couldn't see the real reason Foster wanted to marry her. The marketing wizard needed free advertising. Baylin Tea was selling well, but it could always sell more. And products like Mystical Chinese Weight Loss Tea are perfect products for influencers to endorse, especially an attractive, physically unattainable person like Fox. Throughout their short relationship, Foster asked Fox to help promote his tea, and she obliged. At the height of her career, Fox told people in her home country, the UK, to buy Bay Lin Tea. 
Believe it or not, Fox wasn't Balin's most famous spokesperson. Foster reeled in another famous British woman with direct ties to the British royal family, the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson. Like Fox, the Duchess was all over British tabloids, but for different reasons. The Duchess of York, more commonly known as Fergie, is Prince Andrew's ex-wife. Every member of the royal family deals with vast amounts of attention from the press. In the same breath, they also wield a tremendous amount of influence, and anyone associated with them automatically brings credibility, prestige, and royal wonder. In other words, the perfect kind of person to promote a weight loss tea. Foster enlisted Fergie to promote Balin tea throughout Britain, completely unaware that the product was a scam. Eventually, Australia figured out Foster's scam and fined him thousands of dollars, leading to the tea business filing for bankruptcy in 1988. Other con men would have given up. Foster wasn't your average con man. He'd been scamming since his 20s when he swindled $49,000 from an insurance company. Foster still got caught for it and was subsequently fined over $70,000. Nevertheless, Foster kept working, kept scamming. He filmed a documentary with Muhammad Ali, attempted to promote one of his fights, and marketed a new method for quitting smoking. After the Balin tea scam failed, Foster left the UK and traveled to the United States with a new weight loss tea he dubbed Cho Lao. He eventually got in trouble for selling Cho Lao tea and moved back to the UK. Foster immediately got back to his usual activities after moving, marketing phony products and investments in wooing famous women. This time, the victim was married to the most powerful man in Britain, then Prime Minister Tony Blair. Sherry Blair only spent five minutes with Foster, but it was enough time to convince her he was for real. The international man of mischief knew Sherry through a mutual friend named Carol Kaplan, whom Foster was dating. Foster learned that Sherry wanted to buy two properties in Bristol, but didn't want to pay the retail price. The pair corresponded through email, emails that came back to haunt them years later. By the early 2000s, Foster was a well-known fraudster, especially in England, where he committed his most epic crimes. It would look bad for any public figure to hire Foster as their unofficial financial advisor and negotiator, much less the Prime Minister's wife. An individual named Paul Walsh realized the gravity of the situation and called Foster to offer him an ultimatum. Pay $93,000 and he won't leak the story of Foster's dealings with Sherry. Foster roped Walsh into investing in another one of his weight loss schemes called Renuel. Walsh had already sunk thousands into the business and was worried that he'd lose their investment capital if Foster and Sherry's relationship went public. Foster alerted Downing Street, the British equivalent of the White House, and they immediately hired a crisis PR consultant. Sure enough, three days after they hired the consultant, the Daily Mail broke the story and everything erupted in chaos. Needless to say, no one looked good in this story. Many were outraged that the Prime Minister's wife had allowed a con artist into the inner circle of Downing Street. Initially, Downing Street denied knowing Foster. Then, Daily Mail published the email exchanges between Sherry and Foster, showing that they knew each other and talked like business associates. In one email, Sherry called Foster a star, telling him they were on the same wavelength. Sherry Gate was a disaster for both Sherry, her husband Tony, and Foster, who was back in the news again for scandalous reasons. Foster wasn't the only one hurt by the negative publicity. His mother, who'd never scammed anyone in her life, felt the public's wrath. Louise Foster Paletti was a successful real estate agent working primarily on the rapid development of Gold Coast, a beautiful skyscraper-laden city on Australia's east coast. Despite a successful career in real estate, Louise's life, legacy, and reputation were tarnished by her son's dictionary-sized list of crimes. People also criticized her for showing continued support for her son. She advocated for her son many times, visiting him in jail once a week, campaigning for his release, and asking the UK not to extradite him and succeeding. In 2019, Foster's mom revealed that she had terminal cancer. Foster rushed back home to see her when he heard the news and took care of Miss Foster during her final 18 months. Foster told interviewers that he helped care for his bedridden mother like a nurse would, even taking her to the bathroom when she needed help getting there. He says that perhaps the only worthwhile thing he's done in his entire life and will always regret ruining her name along with his. He also said that those 18 months were the most fulfilling and satisfying times of his life. Foster has been pulling cons since the 80s, but that doesn't mean he's old school. His most recent con involved a technology that most young people are familiar with, crypto. In 2020, Foster scammed a pilot from Hong Kong out of $1.7 million worth of Bitcoin. 
The scam revolved around a sports betting company called Sports Predictions that Foster was promoting. Foster, operating under the fake name Mark Hughes, told potential investors that a hired mathematician would use their skill to predict the outcomes of sporting events with near 100% accuracy. The savvy fraudster accepted Bitcoin as payment from the pilot and ran off with the man's money. In December of 2021, a team of professional fugitive hunters tracked Foster down to a home in Victoria, Australia, where he'd been staying while on the run for six months. When they arrived, the team of officers broke down the door and burst into the home. They found him inside and dragged a disheveled looking Foster out of the house by his arm. Ironically, this wasn't Foster's most bizarre arrest. His most iconic arrest occurred in Fiji, where Foster was literally running away from police. He was cornered on a bridge and decided he'd rather face the water. So Foster stripped down to his underwear and leapt over the side. On his way down, Foster hit his head on a boat and passed out in the water. Fijian police proceeded to fish Foster's unconscious body from the river and put him into a truck. Foster's career is entering its twilight period. Even though he's still scamming people, one of his main goals is to change how people remember him. He says he will accomplish this seemingly impossible feat by telling his story in cinematic form. Yes, Foster wants to film a movie about his life, but from his point of view. His plan is pretty simple. Foster will market the book he wrote on his life and career as a con man, similar to Frank Abagnale's highly disputed memoir, and hope a filmmaker wants to adapt the book into a biopic. According to an interview with the Sydney Morning Herald, Foster says he's very aware of his putrid reputation, as he calls it, and hopes that people will better understand him after seeing his story. However, Foster's hopes are a bit misplaced. Foster has never turned over a new leaf, unlike Abagnale, who redeemed himself after years of crime. Every time he gets out of prison, Foster starts a new scheme, or multiple schemes in some cases. And he's been running through the same cycle for his entire adult life. Paul Carter stole millions from his victims, but what makes this case unique is that Carter stole from the ones he supposedly loved most, his family. Various ex-wives, his former fiancée, and even his own mother were all conned by Carter, not to mention several businesses and other individuals. Carter, also known as Paul Cristallo, denied all accusations, arguing that it was all a revenge plot from disgruntled relatives and exes. After stealing from more than four ex-lovers, he became known as the Casanova Con Man. In the 1990s, the Cristallo family had a company called Alpine Concept, which was dedicated to snow gear. As the company expanded, so did Carter. Carter's taste for the finer thing. He bought fast, luxury cars and racked up thousands in debt by racing and repairing them. At that point, the family realized that their debts were worth more than their assets, so the company tried to up its worth by moving to a bigger building with better machinery, more employees, and flashy cars to improve efficiency and reputation. But it quickly became clear that the business was failing. The business was forced into liquidation. Carter's mother, Gianna Cristallo, was forced to forfeit her house. It destroyed her marriage to Carter's late father, Giovanni Cristallo. After the failed business endeavors and his parents' divorce, he changed his last name from Cristallo to Carter. He used this name to start a new life and reinvented himself as a prominent builder from a wealthy family. That's when he gained the confidence to swindle exes and businesses out of their savings. He lied his way into becoming the CEO of Uniting Housing Victoria, a church charity group that helps fight homelessness. He used the position to enrich himself and then ran the organization into the ground, leaving it on the brink of collapse. He also refused to pay several construction businesses after using their services, leaving their hard work unpaid. For many of his victims, Carter was a mystery and a liar. His entire persona was built on lies. He conned women by saying he was a multi-millionaire property developer with excellent financial literacy. Carter convinced his lovers to turn over their financial assets to him, promising to increase the value of their investments. Beyond the stealing, it came out that Carter had a mean streak too. One allegation states that Carter hired a hitman to eliminate his then fiance Catherine Dubois, after discovering that his wife, who he claimed died of bone cancer, was still alive and well in the United States. It was no wonder Carter is called the Casanova Con Man, since most of his victims included ex-female partner. A Casanova, defined as a man known for seducing women and having many lovers, was something Carter was definitely proud to put on his resume. Now, in his fourth marriage, all of his previous lovers fell prey to his charm and confidence, trusting that he would do what was best for their financial assets. Little did they know that Carter's romance and intelligence were all a lie and a ploy to afford a luxurious lifestyle. But at some point, 
he couldn't keep track of the fake stories he created. As if his family hadn't been through enough, Carter struck again. This time, he targeted his mother's partner in Melbourne, the sick and ailing Jim Quattricelli, convincing him to surrender his home and land as a retirement investment. The property and land were valued at $600,000. Carter promised that he would build three townhouses, with one for Quattricelli, who was a hard-working Italian immigrant all his life. Carter said this new home would be fully furnished and accessible, the perfect home for an older person hoping to downgrade and take care of himself. Carter gave him fake legal documents to get Quattrocelli to sign the home's title and land over to him. Quattrocelli spoke limited English and believed Carter. Once he had the deed, Carter used it to take out the maximum amount in loans. He bulldozed the home and put down three concrete slabs, making it look like he was about to begin a big construction project. As soon as he got his loan money, he fled the country. Cristallo and her partner were left with next to nothing. Instead of living out their golden years with retirement savings and financial security, they were stuck paying rent and living off their pensions. Cristallo said she would never forgive her son. With all the lies he told, it's hard to keep track of who Paul Carter was. But one thing that's for sure, he was a notorious ladies' man. He met his first wife, Elise Ryan, in the late 1980s. Ten years later, he abandoned her and their three children. He now owes her more than $150,000 in child support payments. One year later, he married his second wife, true to pattern. He left her after 12 months together. In 2002, Carter sent his future third wife a fake RSVP dating profile and quickly impressed her with his phony resume and intelligence. He married the multimillionaire Brooklyn Facey and had a son with her. Carter earned the trust of Brooklyn's father, Andrew Facey, a prominent Melbourne landowner. Carter fleeced him out of $2 million while married to Brooklyn and used the money for sports cars and luxury mansions in Australia and the US. In 2014, Brooklyn and Carter were living together happily when he flew back to Melbourne to propose to a new woman, Catherine Dubois. Dubois had no idea that Carter was already married, especially since he had previously told her that his wife had died of brain cancer. In the years after, Carter's relationship with fiancé Dubois and wife Brooklyn dissolved. Brooklyn now knows that their relationship was built on lies. But Carter didn't stop there. In 2019, he married his fourth wife, a lawyer named Kelly Sayers. When Brooklyn met Carter in 2002, his dating profile said he was a child-free, single multimillionaire. She quickly fell for him. He was charming, romantic, smart, and kind. Brooklyn thought he was too good to be true. They got married in 2003. Unbeknownst to her, Carter had already been married twice and had three children in Melbourne. He asked to borrow money from Brooklyn and her wealthy father while he said he was waiting for his inheritance from a wealthy European relative. He showed her bank statements and other documents to prove that he was, in fact, rich and waiting for more money. All of these documents were totally fake. Brooklyn and her father loaned him some cash, but he never paid them back. In 2014, tensions mounted over unpaid loans. Brooklyn and her family were owed more than $2 million. Carter suggested they move the family to the U.S. He sent Brooklyn and their son over to the States while he finished up some business deals in Australia. Then he met his next victim, Catherine Dubois. Brooklyn found out about her husband's new woman when her son showed her a photo and asked about the mysterious woman in engagement photos with his father. Brooklyn was mortified. When she confronted Carter about ending the marriage, he went into tantrum, threatening to take her down with him. Now, she and her son sleep with weapons next to their beds, just in case Carter ever comes knocking again. Meanwhile, Dubois thought she finally found her Prince Charming. Twelve weeks after they met online, they were engaged. He gave her a three and a half carat ring, and they held a $250,000 engagement party at the Melbourne State Library in 2014. Dubois wore a beautiful dress with jewels draped around her wrist. Little did she know that those jewels, which Carter gave to her, were all fake. Carter continued to shower her with gifts and drove her around in flashy sports cars. He told her that she was the love of his life. Dubois had no idea that Carter was married. He told her that his previous wife had passed eight years before brain cancer. He went so far as to tell Dubois about his wife's final moments, talking about her rotten breath and hollow, sunken eyes. It wasn't long before Carter asked his new fiance for money. He sneakily charged the engagement party to her, and it got worse from there. Dubois told him that her beauty salon would be bought out by the Australian government soon. After their engagement, Carter convinced Dubois to sign over the rights of the salon to him so that he, the self-proclaimed successful businessman, could negotiate a payout on her behalf. Dubois was stressed about the process and continually worked with a team of lawyers. She was confused why Carter, a supposed multimillionaire, was interested in her $300,000 government payout. 
Two weeks after their lavish engagement party, Dubois received a Facebook message saying that Carter's wife was still alive. She was shocked. Carter found a reason to change his name again, this time to Paul Hamilton. As if Carter didn't make an enemy out of women everywhere, he was able to marry a fourth time to a new woman, Kelly Sayers, who vows to defend him to the bitter end. The best part? They met because Sayers was his divorce lawyer who, you guessed it, Carter couldn't afford to pay. The couple moved to Albany, New York, where Carter worked as a self-employed tradie. They drive matching black and white Mercedes sedans despite living in a modest townhouse. When the media reached out to Carter, he admitted to lying about his third wife's death. He also admitted to lying about supposed European inheritance money. But then he got aggressive and denied taking money from the women he was involved with. But beyond his ex-lovers, he stole money from church organizations and housing for the disabled. His new wife Sayers stood by her man and said that the other women were just jealous now and that he'd moved on from them. According to Carter, Neither the U.S. nor Australian governments have approached him about the allegations, so they must not be true. The Casanova con man was finally arrested and spent two nights in a detention facility before being released on house arrest with a GPS ankle bracelet. The criminal case against Carter involves taking advantage of an immigration law loophole when the State Department refused to renew his visa. A complaint filed by the Department of Homeland Security said that Carter denies ever going by any other names or being arrested. But there are records of him being arrested in Australia for growing 12 marijuana plants. When agents interviewed Carter, he admitted to overstaying his visa and going through the process of changing his name to Paul Hamilton. In May 2022, Carter went on trial and was ordered to pay a meager $5,000 fine after pleading guilty to visa fraud. While this crime would typically cause someone like Carter to be deported, his marriage to a U.S. citizen might keep him safe for now. He's already applied to stay in the country. His new wife received a job offer in Australia, and the couple requested permission to relocate there. Carter needs this marriage to work. His life, quite literally, depends on it. He will be arrested and confronted with severe allegations if he returns to Australia. His third wife, Brooklyn, doesn't think anyone will ever see the money he stole from them. The best she can hope for is that karma will put Carter in prison for life. In 2017, Colleen Greenwood was prepared to walk down the aisle with the man she thought was her soulmate. The date came several months after James Scott <gasps> staged a romantic proposal that included a so-called diary that laid out all the wedding plans in detail. He promised a lavish ceremony in England followed by an extravagant Las Vegas honeymoon. Colleen figured he could easily afford it since James bragged about how much money he had in the bank. Not only was he wealthy, but he was a hero who risked his own life by jumping out of a window to save a child from a burning home. Colleen's firefighting fiance had it all, or so she thought. She had been looking forward to moving her new family, including the couple's young son, into a home valued at one and a half million pounds. She believed they would also launch a new hotel and restaurant with help from Gordon Ramsay. However, as the wedding date approached, Colleen figured out the truth about her fiancé. Virtually everything he told her about himself was part of an intricate scheme. Her fiancé spun such an elaborate web of lies that even when he asked her and her sister for money, they agreed, despite believing he was worth millions. Although Colleen knew her fiancé as James Scott, his real name was Greg Wilson. She didn't find this out until the day they were supposed to get married, and that lie was just the tip of the iceberg. Colleen was browsing a dating site in September 2014 and was immediately drawn to the profile of someone calling himself Firefighter J. They started a conversation, and the mystery man identified himself as James Scott, a fireman who was filthy rich. He was seven years younger than Colleen, who believed she had met the man of her dreams. James, as he called himself, proceeded to weave a complex narrative that caused everyone in Colleen's circle of friends and family to agree. Despite the two divorces she had under her belt, the blushing bride-to-be clearly thought this time would be different. Of course, the relationship wasn't perfect. Greg frequently told his fiance that his job required him to be away from home four days a week. While he wanted Colleen to believe he was spending that time at the fire station, 
The reality couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, Greg wasn't a firefighter at all. When he left Colleen alone for days at a time, he was actually spending time with his wife at their home about 30 miles away. Greg and his wife had been married for 13 years at that point. He also fabricated other aspects of his life to impress Colleen, most notably by claiming that he had tons of money in the bank. Greg insisted that his family was wealthy and his mom worked as a successful sports agent in France. To keep up the ruse, he forged a range of documents that showed he had two million pounds tucked away. Pretending to be rich made it easier for him to convince Colleen, her sister, and other victims to hand over their money when he needed it. As for his supposed bravery when battling blazes throughout England, Greg had plenty of stories to impress Colleen. He regaled her with tales of heroism, including the time he supposedly leaped from the window of a burning building with a child gripped in his arms. Even if some aspects of his life seemed too good to be true, the bride-to-be could look past those details and focus Focus on the fact that she was engaged to a wealthy firefighter willing to put his own life in danger to help others. However, there was nothing Greg wouldn't lie about. After emerging as a single woman following a pair of failed marriages, Colleen made it clear that she didn't want any more kids. It was already tough enough for her and her children to navigate life after those previous relationships ended in divorce. When she discussed the topic with Greg, she was thrilled to hear that he was on board. In 2015, Colleen got pregnant, but the couple agreed it would be best to get an abortion. Greg decided to take matters into his own hands to prevent any further pregnancy scares. The next month, he said he had a vasectomy to prevent him from fathering any more children. He even returned from the hospital with bandages supporting his claim. For Colleen, the last piece of the puzzle appeared to fit into place. She was looking forward to enjoying the rest of her life with the man she still knew as James Scott and took comfort in knowing that there wouldn't be an unexpected pregnancy to disrupt their plans for marital bliss. But when Colleen learned she was pregnant again, all all those plans fell apart. In September 2016, Greg heard the news and didn't seem all that surprised. He referred to the child as their miracle baby, conceived despite his previous vasectomy. If he actually had the surgery, any resulting pregnancy would be a miracle. Medical professionals say vasectomies are the most effective form of birth control outside of complete abstinence. With a permanent success rate of over 99%, it was unheard of for Greg and Colleen to conceive a child after the surgery. But he stuck to his story and she decided the pregnancy was a sign that they were supposed to have a child together. Unfortunately, there were some severe complications throughout the pregnancy. Giving birth to their premature son, Charlie, almost cost Colleen her life. While Colleen was still pregnant with Charlie, Greg popped the question. On the surface, it looked like a romantic gesture to ensure the couple would be together as they raised their, quote, miracle babe. In reality, this was another opportunity for Greg to get closer to the end goal of a heartbreaking financial scam. Even though he assured his fiance that he had millions in the bank, he presented her and her sister with an investment opportunity that they believed would result in a huge payoff down the road. He promised his wife-to-be and her sister that they could quit their jobs and live comfortably off the income created by his foolproof plan. Greg did his homework and established documents detailing the boutique hotel and restaurant he intended to open. With the involvement and input of a world-renowned celebrity chef, Colleen and her sister believed this was the opportunity of a lifetime. They contributed more than 58,000 pounds to help get the project off the ground. To set the stage for his long con, Greg created fraudulent evidence that he had established a property management company to handle all the details. He called it Gemini Property Services and forged recommendations, references, and statements of support from a host of supposed investors, including a few prominent soccer players. He also convinced Colleen's sister to hand over another 10,000 pounds, which he used to buy a new Mini Cooper instead of investing it in the business. Adding insult to injury, he used that Mini Cooper as his getaway car leaving Colleen behind with their son and never looking back. The scam involved other victims too. He convinced individuals and businesses to put money into his scheme on the promise that Gordon Ramsay would be running the hotel's restaurant and plenty of celebrities would be on hand to help honor its grand opening. Greg promised the investors exclusive access to the hotel and its amenities, even though he clearly had no plans of ever making good on them. One particularly bold aspect of the scheme involved a local rugby club. He convinced 
convinced the Newcastle Falcons to offer him an exclusive membership on the vow that he would provide a large sum of money for sponsorship. Of course, he knew he'd never pay the club a nickel. He simply used his fraudulent connection to the Newcastle Falcons to prove his fake hotel was rooted in reality. As the wedding date drew near, Greg knew that he had a lot of loose ends to tie up. Remember, he still had a wife and kids. Although he told Colleen he was previously married, he assured her they were divorced and his ex-wife took the kids and moved to Texas. To buy himself more time, he kept inventing new lies. Greg sunk so low that he faked a cancer diagnosis that would postpone the wedding date. In addition to his health scare, he claimed he needed to delay the event again so he could travel to America and bring his daughter back to England for the big day. When he returned, however, the kids weren't with him. His delay tactics arguably worked, at least for a while. His fake excuses allowed him to push back the wedding twice. Colleen's sister started to get suspicious. After a little research, she determined that Greg never even booked a reservation at the wedding venue in the first place. That shocking revelation was just the first of many, which left Colleen with the sickening realization that she had been duped by the man she thought would be with her through thick and thin. Greg finally recognized that his time was up, but he had one cruel trick left up his sleeve. While in the driver's seat of the Mini Cooper, he handed over Charlie to Colleen and drove off. He might have hoped to completely disappear and leave his financial crimes behind, but his dirty deeds soon caught up with him. In 2020, Greg appeared in court for sentencing after he pleaded guilty to financial crimes and entering a false name on Charlie's birth certificate. As Colleen looked on via a live video feed, the judge in the case criticized Greg for his evil scam. The judge described him as arrogant and cruel for stealing money from the woman he claimed to love. He also criticized Greg for lying about the vasectomy, his own health, and the status of his marriage. Finally, the judge insisted that Greg was too cowardly to face what he had done, instead choosing to abandon Colleen and their son on what should have been his wedding day. While Greg was sentenced to spend six years behind bars, Colleen was left with a lifetime of regret and anxiety. She spoke to media outlets and submitted a statement to the court that reflected her heartache and sadness after being victimized by the man she fell in love with. Even after learning all the despicable pieces of his secret life, Colleen said she still referred to him as James, the name he provided when they first started dating. She felt stupid for falling for his lies and guilty for causing her sister financial hardship. Worse still, she said the ordeal has caused her daughters from previous relationships to lose their ability to trust other people. As for Charlie, she already dreads the tough conversation she'll eventually have with him about his father. Despite the circumstances around Charlie's birth, Colleen loves her son and regrets that she will one day have to tell him that his father was a brazen liar and a con artist. In Queenstown, New Zealand, Emma Ferris stood inside her local Westpac bank, clutching the arm of her new boyfriend of six months, Andrew Thompson. Although she pretended like she was in love, she absolutely hated him. But there she was, standing next to Andrew pretending to be a loving girlfriend, reminding herself that if Andrew would just sign the papers, she'd nearly be done with him. $200,000 would go right into her bank account. Emma was unsure exactly of what Andrew was capable of. She started to second guess if this was a good idea, but if she was going to get the money, she'd have to push through. The couple were taken into a private room to wait for the bank rep to bring the transfer forms. Eventually, the rep came in with a smile, sat down at the desk, and handed Emma the forms. Emma slid them over to Andrew, who seemed to be in his own world. He looked at Emma, then down at the papers. He stared. Then 37-year-old Emma Ferris had finally decided to date for the first time since she was 22. A year out from an amicable divorce to her husband of 14 years, the physiotherapist wasn't too sure about dating prospects in her tiny New Zealand town of Glenarchy, but her adoring family made her a tender profile and opened her prospects up. It wasn't long before she came across Andrew Thompson, a successful businessman from nearby Alexandra who said all the normal stuff people say on their dating profiles. He liked the outdoors. He likes to travel. Likes to have fun, because who doesn't like to have fun? And his smile looked friendly. This all sounded awesome to Emma, who, wouldn't you know it, also likes the outdoors, likes to travel, have fun, and look friendly when she's smiling. Love connection. After a few online chats, Andrew treated Emma to a coffee date at an exclusive country club where they sat for three hours, her staring dreamily into his eyes, him prattling on and on about his business ventures in the way only a true Casanova would. 
Emma had actually had quite a few successful property developments herself, being a pretty astute entrepreneur in her own right, really loved this shared interest and began to feel a real connection. Former professional wakeboarder and Australian Football League player Andrew Thompson hailed from Tasmania, Australia. From the start, Andrew was upfront with Emma about his lack of any social media. He was forced to hire a PR firm to scrub the internet clean of any reference to him after he had been the victim of identity theft in the US. It seemed odd, but Emma felt it was better he told her than her finding out on her own. So Emma was forced to get to know Andrew the way people had to in the ancient times of the 90s, when every bit of someone's personal information couldn't be found online and you had to just believe what people said and go with your gut. As they began to see each other more, Andrew did eventually confess that there was something he'd been hiding. He had done six months in an Australian jail for unwittingly importing and selling motorcycles to gang members. He claimed he was never charged with anything, but wasn't proud of the experience. Emma could not find anything online to disprove what he was saying, but she said that his detailed stories felt authentic and believable. As time went on, Emma saw more warning signs than I did that time I tried to get on the freeway through an off-ramp. And like me, she ignored them, because flashing red lights and blaring horns always reminded me of Christmas. Emma never got to meet any of Andrew's friends or family. He would often have to unexpectedly cancel their plans, and every friend or family member of hers who met Andrew always felt a bit uneasy with him. After interrogating Andrew on their first meeting, Emma's sister Sarah could find no fault with the man, the only fault being he was a little too perfect. <laughs> Same here. Andrew and Emma's dating life was fairly casual, though Emma found herself making excuses for Andrew's occasional odd behavior. After all, she really, really liked him, so she wanted to give every benefit of the doubt she could. When they did meet up, Andrew would often love bomb her with weekend getaways and lavish gifts. Not something Emma was really looking for, but it was nice to be doted on. One of Andrew and Emma's shared passions was their entrepreneurships, his in business ventures and hers in property development. Emma's eyes would light up when their conversations would drift towards these topics, so they would often have dates looking at local Queenstown properties, or he'd show her a property he owned or one of his potential investment sites. As the days wore on, Emma became more and more smitten, and her family became more and more suspicious. Andrew claimed he was in various company directorships, but when Emma's brother searched the government's New Zealand company's office website, a business registry, he found no mention of Andrew Thompson. Andrew explained it away that the companies were merely in transition and that he was in contact with the owners and that no worries, everything is good. Emma was always looking for new business opportunities to afford her more family time and had begun talks with her bank about financing a new property development. Andrew had an idea. What if instead of investing in the property she found, she invested with his company, ATI Group LTD? It was as if the heavens opened up and the stars aligned. He had produced via his accountant a sheet showing that he had $8 million in assets back in Australia, so he was good for the loan. He could set her up to receive a high interest rate to make a good return. The loan would be earmarked for a specific development, so it would be protected. He could let her withdraw her money at any time. There were only pros, no cons. All Emma would need to do is loan Andrew $50,000. He would put up one of his properties as collateral and an agreement could be drawn up. It was going to be so great, Emma didn't even remember to ask why Andrew needed a $50,000 loan. Soon, the interest payments started rolling in. Emma was happy. Andrew had moved to a nearby high-end rental and leased a brand new truck, and things were going great. Finally, that hole left by a 14-year marriage was filled, and light was good. Since Andrew had made his loan interest payments, as far as Emma was concerned, any and all concerns her family and friends had about Andrew could be put to bed. Things went so well that Andrew suggested another property to Emma would be more lucrative, but the loan amount he needed was $250,000. Emma was enthusiastic about this new investment prospect, but more so relieved that Andrew was proving to be who he said he was. So, Emma quickly had her lawyer draw up another contract, contacted her bank with the plans, showed Andrew's Australian assets sheet, and hit the go button. Unable to contain her excitement, Emma called up one of her close friends, Sarsha Hope, and talked her ear off about the whole thing, about Andrew, about their connection, how her family had been suspicious at first but he'd been making good on the first loan, and how she's about to make a lot more money on her more substantial loan. 
As soon as Sasha got off the phone, she immediately called their mutual friend Joe and expressed concern over the story she'd just been told. Sasha and Joe's husbands both agreed that something was wrong with all this and went to work. On Monday night, Joe's husband checked into ATI groups on New Zealand Company's office website registry and happened to find a consent form signed by an Andrew Tonks Thompson, a name no one had heard yet. A search of Andrew Tonks Thompson led to a mention in the Otago Daily Times, Otago being a region of New Zealand in which Queenstown is located. The story of an Andrew Charles Tonks who'd been in prison for two years for two frauds totaling $35,000. You get one guess who the man pictured in the article looked like, and I'll give you a hint. It wasn't Frank Abigail, as portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio. Sasha's 7.30 a.m. phone call made Emma's stomach drop, the truth that she had deep down known all along was verified, and the denial she clung to in search of her happy ending could no longer support her weight. Emma didn't know what to do, so she called literally everyone she could think of. The police, her family, the bank, but the transaction had been completed with a fraud. Once Emma had Andrew's real name, the information hose was turned on full blast, and the flood was difficult and painful. Among other deceits, Emma discovered that Andrew had never owned that trucking company he'd worked for as a dispatcher. The initial property investment she'd given him went to an alcohol company, and he didn't own the current property he was seeking her investment on. Andrew had changed his name after his 2016 conviction. Prior to that, Andrew W.C. Tonks Thompson, aka Andrew Charlton Thompson, had seven previous counts of stealing and had served 28 months behind bars. The $8 million in assets account was forged. Emma decided she wouldn't let Andrew do this to her. She had to do something. She just wasn't sure what. Emma tried to get Thompson to slow down on the business deal so she could buy more time to figure out her next move. But Thompson was opposed, so the loan had gone through and her money was now in Thompson's account where it would stay. Unless Emma's one shot was to somehow con Thompson into reversing the money back into her account. This meant maintaining their relationship to keep Thompson's confidence. Thompson knew that Emma had close ties to her family, and he also knew that they were suspicious of him, a fact that Emma would play to her advantage. Luckily for Emma, any odd behavior on her part, she just blamed on the stressful situation her brother created. She had explained to Andrew that morning that her brother was the reason he needed to reverse the $200,000 back into her account. Andrew seemed a little suspicious of the sudden change of heart, but he trusted Emma. The only real concern Emma had, other than being discovered, was Andrew's sudden furious comment on the way into the bank that her brother doing this to her was the type of thing he would normally have someone's legs broken for. His eyes and tone said he was serious and he claimed to know people. The comment visibly startled Emma, but Andrew quickly reassured her that nothing would be done. So, there the couple sat in that suffocating room in the bank, both pretending to be in a relationship, when Thompson finally signed the $200,000 back into Emma's account. After the funds had been reversed and the deal had been cancelled, Thompson went back to Australia. The moment he left, Emma contacted the police who told her there was nothing they could do as long as Thompson wasn't on New Zealand soil. In order to make an arrest, Emma would have to somehow convince Thompson to come back. If Emma was going to have any hope of justice being done, the con must continue. Emma kept up the pretense of their relationship, so Thompson doubled down on his deceptions. As it turned out, her friends and family were right to be suspicious because Thompson was being deceptive. To better explain, he sent Emma an 11-page manuscript that was to be his autobiography, The Tonks Trilogy. In it, Thompson claimed that he'd actually been involved in international counterterrorism. Thompson had pretended to get arrested and sent to prison to get close to inmates. His story was that he maintained a cover as a millionaire to infiltrate a money laundering and human trafficking scheme. So, he pretended to be the wealthy business owner, having to pretend to be filthy and homeless to get close to a terrorist cell safe house. Thompson was a real-life James Bond crossed with Michael Scarn. Andrew's true lies were true lies. Thompson swore he he'd return to New Zealand and pay Emma the rest of the money he had borrowed, $80,800, once he got back from his final spy mission in Australia. It's always that one last mission that gets you. Of course, Emma boldly continuing her pretext convinced him she wanted to continue the relationship, so Thompson decided to make a return trip to New Zealand. On June 13, 2019, a New Zealand detective called Emma. Andrew Thompson was apprehended and headed to Christchurch Men's Penitentiary. Emma collapsed, relieved and elated. 
Andrew W.C. Tonks Thompson pled guilty to two counts of fraud and the theft of $300,000 in a special relationship, two charges of using a forged document, two charges of managing a company while prohibited, and making a false statement with a shareholder consent form. Thompson received a 28-month jail sentence and was ordered to pay Emma reparations and emotional harm damages of $71,800, not $80,800 he still owed her but close. That eel Thompson, however, managed to slime his reparations down from $71,800 to $12,000 and ended up only serving one year of his two-year and four-month sentence and was now on a new dating app, Bumble, where he was looking for another chance at love or conning. Thompson had quickly gone on a date with a woman who was immediately put off by his bizarre stories of counterterrorism, claims that he lived in a $40 million house, and was involved in a multi-million dollar building development in Sydney, Australia. She went online to look him up and immediately found Thompson's rap sheet and contacted authorities. This was a clear violation of Thompson's parole since he had restricted use of any device that could access the internet without his probate's approval. In a letter to his parole board, Thompson said he really was just looking for friendship and that he couldn't be honest about his past because it would drive people away. Obviously, that meant just making up crazy stuff instead, and definitely not conning. He also compared his situation to a powerless alcoholic gambler being released from rehab to Las Vegas. A, well, what did you think I was going to do? Explanation that seems like more of an argument to keep him incarcerated. Rather than send Thompson back to prison, the parole board felt they could simply monitor his online activities better, and that should mitigate any risk he posed. Apparently, you're allowed to violate your parole in New Zealand. Thompson, when asked about what he did to Emma Ferris, said he was living beyond his means at the time and was trying to make a name for himself in New Zealand and was in a bad headspace, but that he really was looking for love. He claims he won't change his name again and seems to accept the fact that dating is no longer an option for him. Given his inability to resist conning, <laughs> that doesn't seem likely. Emma, as of 2022, is still out of her $88,800 that Andrew owes her, and she feels like she'll never see it. In order to heal, Emma and her sister created a podcast where she details her entire ordeal in order to help herself heal and to help others who've gone through something similar. Emma's podcast, Conning the Con, goes further in depth into her experience and is well worth a listen. Between January 2016 and September of 2019, Rubin Sarpong and his squad worked together to scam women in New Jersey and the surrounding area on online dating apps. His accomplices lived in Ghana while he lived in the US. What he and the team would do is set up fake dating profiles all over the place on various dating websites such as Plenty of Fish, OkCupid, and Tinder. Sarpong would routinely hit up women on online dating sites looking for romance. Whatever platform form you could think of, he was on there messaging women. He would message and quickly sweet talk women looking for love. But then, he quickly turned the conversation into a promise of getting rich. It goes without saying that they would always use a fake person identity. Sometimes they'd go through the trouble of making fake IDs as well. They also had to set up numerous email addresses, numerous phone numbers, and numerous bank accounts, and most of the time, they posed as US military personnel stationed overseas. But why the military? Simply put, it's because of the fact that being in the military just makes things much easier for scammers in general. It's actually quite smart for the scammers. The fact that military personnel are stationed outside the US makes it easy for scammers to make up excuses why they don't have something a normal person would have when someone asks them questions. They can just blame everything on the fact that they're overseas in the military. Plus, there's the whole secrecy thing they can play up with the government at play. Hundreds of times a day, women all over the world are being conned by scammers posing as US service members. This is according to Chris Gray from the US Army Criminal Investigation Command. They literally get hundreds of calls a day about dating scams. Most of the victims are women in the US. They mostly range from their late 30s to late 70s. You'd think that it would be someone who's dumb and uneducated. Nope. Gray says that education doesn't matter. Plenty of highly educated people get scammed as well. According to Gray, there's one easy step to avoid getting scammed by a military imposter. Just ask to be sent an email from his or her military account ending in .mil. Gray says the scammers will do everything they can to get around this email check. They'll quickly just make up another lie, such as saying they're on a top secret mission. Hotspots for online romance scams include Nigeria and other countries in West Africa. But today, there's only a small number 
number of personnel in the West African region. For example, fewer than 50 military and civilian employees and contractors are in Nigeria. After Sarpong establishes some virtual sparks with the women, this is when the real work starts. He starts asking them for help in the form of money. For Sarpong, gold was always involved. Sarpong would make up that money was needed for the purpose of paying to get gold bars into the U.S. The stories that Sarpong and his team use aren't the same every time. They tailor it for each woman. Most of the time, Sarpong would claim to be a soldier stationed in Syria. He'd say he either received, found, or was awarded gold bars. He's now rich, but he had a problem. He didn't have enough cash on hand to ship the gold bars himself. There were taxes to be paid, shipping fees, and other fake invoices that needed to be paid in order to get the gold to the U.S. You tell the women that their money would be returned once the gold bars were back to the States, and of course, they'd get a lot more money back for their efforts. Let's get into some details with the scam. One unidentified and unfortunate lady we'll call scammed victim number one went back and forth with Sarpong. He told her that he was stationed in Syria and his unit had received millions of dollars worth of gold bars. He told this lady that he was given one of the boxes of gold and that box was worth $12 million. Why do people fall for this? Has anyone heard of the military ever giving away gold bars to soldiers? Anyways, Sarpong started asking her if she could help him get the bars back to the US once he knew she was hooked. And this is where Sarpong usually has the ladies talk to one of his team members just so they could build some trust in the ladies' minds. In this specific instance, someone on his squad posed as a diplomat named Alwyn Rolf Liss. He was supposed to help her help Sarpong with the transfer of the gold back to the US. The fake diplomat would have the perfect answer for every one of her questions. How come Liss didn't have his own US bank account? Because he wasn't a US citizen. So he had the victim wire her money to his secretary's bank account. He told her this this was the account he used whenever he arranged gold deliveries for people. Of course, that bank account actually belonged to Sarpong. Even after the victim wired the money over, they would keep talking to her. Why would they do this? If they found someone who would send money one time, why wouldn't they send money a second time, or a third time, or maybe a fourth time? The money just keeps coming until the women realize they're getting scammed. Basically, they're going for max value per scam here. A few days later, fake diplomat Liss told victim number one the good news. He would be flying from Syria to New York and then to Maryland with the gold. He emailed a copy of a fake airway bill that showed the two trunks with the quote, family treasure that were being shipped to her. The fake airway bill had her address on it. They really tried to make it seem like she was getting the gold. He was listed as the delivery agent, but there was one problem. There would be extra costs. Liss also attached a copy of a fake United Nations identity card that showed that he was an Israeli citizen and an official delivery agent for the UN. Also, he told her that way she would recognize him when she picked him up at the airport. From approximately May 22, 2018 to June 12, 2018, Sarpong and his scam team successfully scammed almost $94,000 from this particular lady running this usual military play. But Sarpong didn't always go after women. And he didn't always use the military. He went after at least one man. Sarpong pretended to be a lady who was living in Florida in one instance. Sarpong played a lady who was waiting on a large inheritance that was mostly in gold from her dad's estate in Ghana. Because whose dad wouldn't have their assets mostly in gold? We'll call this guy scammer victim number two, or number two for short. Sarpong told number two an attorney named Mumani Muhammad was helping her get her inheritance to the US, but she needed funds in order to cover the court costs, airway bills, document fees, export fees, and taxes. She's now rich, but she just didn't have the cash on hand. Their scam is just a spin-off of the Nigerian prince scam, right? Muhammad had instructed number two to wire the money to Sarpong, who Muhammad would refer to as one of his sons in New Jersey. And when number two asked why his son had a different last name, he would just make up a different lie. You would think these scammers would be extremely careful, but they're really not. They make up a lot of sophisticated sounding lies, but they still make mistakes on the fly. But what helps them also is just the little glimmer of hope for love and money from the victim. Muhammad ended up making up the excuse that Sarpong was someone who used to work for him and that he misspoke. This guy still sent the money anyway. All for the hope of even more money coming back, along with getting to help someone who he thinks is a real woman. Number two eventually wired a little over $300,000 to Sarpong and his team. Of the roughly $2.1 million that they were able to scam out of people, about 40% went to Sarpong and the remaining money went to the rest of the team. So what did Sarpong do with his portion? If you check out Sarpong's Instagram, he was definitely desperate for attention. You can just tell that he wanted the world to know that he was living it up. He craved that validation of a successful businessman. Funny thing is, is that no one really paid attention. None of his posts have that many likes. 
Ultimately, he did these scams and made some money. Instead of saving the money and trying not to get caught, here he was blowing the money on random frivolous things and posting it online. It's like he almost wanted to get caught. Investigators eventually caught on to Sarpong and his team. They said that he was the ringleader of the international operation that scammed over 30 women. He was charged in federal court with just a single count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And he was the only one actually charged because everyone else was international. Here's the craziest thing. He actually asked the judge to assign him to a public defender. Why? Because he claimed he didn't have enough money to pay for a lawyer. Click here to watch one of these next videos. And let us know in the comments section if you would rather try to meet someone online or meet someone in real life when it comes to dating.